says part of the reason the Supermax prison was built has died. 67-year-old Thomas Silverstein died this month. He was in intensive care following a surgery earlier this year. Continuing our coverage of Colorado at 6, Silverstein went to prison back in 78 for armed robbery. He was later found guilty of killing a prison guard and two inmates at a federal pen in Indiana. Well, those murders inspired the design of the Supermax prison here in Florence, Colorado. Silverstein was moved there in 2005. It's believed he spent more time in solitary confinement than any other federal inmate. He was in solitary at various prisons since 19... Prisoners in solitary confinement may have adequate food and water. Their cells may meet criteria for humane treatment, but deprived of human contact, utterly cut off from the world, that is enough for many human rights groups to consider it torture. We return now to ABC's Dan Harris, entering his final stretch in solitary. 42 hours in solitary, and my downstairs neighbor is acting up again. When guards come to get him for a court appearance, he refuses to leave. The inmate appears to be yelling for a shotgun. Mr. Harris, pack all your stuff up, get everything together, make sure you bring all your trash out, you're being released. Finally, after nearly 48 hours, it's the moment I've been waiting for. I am glad that is over. Before I leave here for good, the guards let me interview some of my fellow inmates about this experience we've now shared. Not a man in this place is not the same as when they came in here. It changes you? Oh, yeah. Most definitely. There are some people who think solitary confinement is, is punishment? torture. Yeah. Straight up it legalized is. torture. It is. So it's the hardest thing I ever did. If this is the hardest thing you've ever well, done? By far. I don't know how much sympathy there is in the general public mm -hmm. for people who have committed no, there's, crimes. There's none. You can make a case that it, it's good for some people who keep getting in trouble like you to be hit in the face with reality. Like if you're violent, I think you should be in here. But other than that, I don't think you should be in solitary. It is perhaps not surprising that the criminals who are actually locked up in solitary would argue that it's torture. You wouldn't turn right here. But as I'm guided out of the jail... People are usually in a good mood at this point in the process. You know, majority of the people are in an ecstatic mood. Given my stuff back... But I think the main thing you'd be looking for would be your cell phone. I missed my cell phone. Okay. And allowed to change into my own clothes... So let's just put the clothes in that hole right there. Mixed in with the giddiness of liberty. We'll head out this way here. Are real right. questions about the cost of solitary confinement in this country, financial, psychological, and societal. Freedom will start once we pass this second door. After all, all of this is being done in our Outside name and on our Outside dime. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Denver. Hidden in this small town of Florence, Colorado, is a place so secluded and secure, it is considered the Alcatraz of the Rockies. ADX Florence is the highest security prison in the world, housing the most dangerous criminals. So we have a look at the Supermax in this special edition of DBL's True Crime Chronicles. Lingering in the shadows of Colorado's Rocky Mountains, lies the country's only federal supermax prison. ADX Florence is closed off to the rest of the world. On the outside, armed security guards, gun towers, and cameras. On the inside, pure isolation. Inmates spend an average of 23 hours a day in a seven by 12 foot concrete cell with a bed, desk, toilet, sink, and shower. Meals are slid through a small hole in the door. The only glimpse of the outside world is a tiny window. This prison was specifically designed to keep every inmate in solitary confinement. No one has escaped since it opened in 1994. The Supermax incarcerates criminals deemed too dangerous for the average prison, like the notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who was transferred in July after escaping two prisons in Mexico. Boston Marathon bomber Johar Cernayev, Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, and Oklahoma City bomber Terry Nichols are also incarcerated here. Of the 400 inmates, one was considered the most dangerous. 
Terrible Tommy Silverstein. He killed three inmates and a prison guard in jail before being transferred to the Supermax. Tommy spent more than three decades in solitary confinement before dying this year. The few who have been inside and made it out call the Supermax life after death. Others say it's a clean version of hell. Wow, uh, we are joined now by Alan Prendergast, a senior reporter at Westward Magazine in Denver. Thank you for joining us. Thanks I can't imagine uh, even stepping foot in that facility. Now, you've spent the past 30 years writing on high security prisons and historic crimes, and you were also one of the last reporters allowed at this Supermax uh, prison. So everyone wants to know, what was it like inside? What's a typical day like? Please tell us. It's a very disorienting experience. You go through a maze of locks, doors, sally ports, uh, surveillance. Um, the staff are in these control rooms with these panels of lights, sort of like the Starship Enterprise, wow. and they're controlling remotely what's going on and intensely monitoring what is happening with the inmates, who are mostly just in their cells. They never interact, ever. These in, like, would Very Ted rarely. Kaczynski interact with El Chapo, ever? Well, the only way that would probably happen is during a uh, recreation period if they were both in different cages on the yard. Near each other. But most of the real high-profile ones tend to be even more isolated, wow. so that they may not be allowed on the yard. Someone like Silverstein would have been allowed on the yard uh, with other inmates. Right. He would have been alone doing that. So. Chilling. Uh, yeah. Well, you speaking of that, you've written a lot about isolation cells and actually read an article that said that uh, because they've been in there for 23 hours a day, they start to see things. Uh, and you've, um, it, it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, you said that it's almost like, uh, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Torture. Mm -hmm. uh, would, do you think that this would kind of uh, violate our uh, United States anti-torture laws because of like what, what they're being subjected to, even well, though they are despicable people? Right, right. Well, I, there is a serious issue there. International rights organizations do consider that degree of isolation to be uh, torture. I mean, it is debilitating. We have studies that show people that are isolated like that, uh, uh, they, they become very sensitive to noise and light. They sometimes become paranoid. They do hallucinate sometimes. If they already have some mental illness, and a lot of inmates do. It can be exacerbated by that. There are, there are instances of suicide, mutilation, things like that. Um, and yes, it's a problem because on one hand, we do want to keep these people isolated because they are extremely dangerous, some of them. Uh, but uh, at what point does that become not a good thing? I mean, at state level, uh, a lot of prisons are rethinking solitary because if these people are going to get out someday, they've been very damaged by this. And some people in ADX, uh, the Supermax, do get released at some point down the line. So you have to think about that in terms of public safety as well as whether you're being humane. We just learned about terrible Tommy Silverstein, which a lot of people might not know about. And you wrote back and forth with him. You never interviewed him in person. Did he ever have any regrets at the end of his life? He just passed away this past year, I yeah. believe. Yeah, he did. He was actually a very interesting guy. I mean, he's one of the reasons ADX was built, because these murders took place at another high security prison, but the security wasn't adequate enough to keep him further isolated. Mm -hmm. He particularly regretted he murdered a correctional officer at that prison. and. Uh, over the years, he did really have, uh, you know, I think a change of heart about some of the things that he did when he was an Aryan Brotherhood leader and thought wow. was, the, you know, was following the convict code about these things. Um, but you yes, he was back and forth with him. Oh yes, you know, we corresponded for years. He's a very, he was a very thoughtful guy. I mean, he had done a lot of thinking and a lot of contemplation over the years. Uh, he was probably the most isolated prisoner in America for much of his career. And, and you know, if you want to talk about torture, the, he he was certainly in position to do that, but uh, he, he didn't seem to lose his marbles when he was in there. Unbelievable. I just have a quick yeah, thing. Please. Because we try to, we interview some of these people and kind of give them a voice rather than, I'd rather give someone like that a voice to say, I was president of the Aryan Brotherhood. It's not worth going down this path. I have regrets. My life's almost coming to an end. I'd rather have those type of things get out there than, why did you do this? And let me p get into your mind a little bit more and almost pu push them up. You want people to learn from I'd rather people. you get those letters that he wrote to you at the end of his life out there. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, there, there are all kinds of people in these places, and some of them are, you know, by any social standards, really bad people. But I think you can learn a lot from people who have been through some of these experiences. Uh, sometimes they've had an opportunity to look at a side of life that most of us just don't experience. An inmate held in solitary confinement for 35 years, longer than any other federal prisoner, has died. 
Thomas Silverstein was held at the Supermax prison in southern Colorado. He entered in 1978 on an armed robbery conviction. He was later convicted of killing two inmates in a prison guard. With no federal death penalty in place at the time of the guard's slaying, the Denver Post reports the Bureau of Prisons put Silverstein in indefinite solitary confinement, where he remained until he was hospitalized in February. He had surgery and was placed in intensive care. The AP did not immediately report on a cause of death. He was 67. Matt Yurich, covering Colorado First. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of Greenlit Gang TV. I uh, appreciate you guys checking out the other videos. Today, we're going to be talking about the very infamous, one of the most famous prisoners um, basically in United States history, none other than Terrible Tom, Thomas Silverstein. Uh, guy was known as one of the longest isolated prisoners in the history of uh, the United States prison system. Born February 4th, 1952. Born in Long Beach, California. Now, spent about 42 years in prison, 35 of those years were spent in total and extreme isolation uh, over a couple different prisons. This gentleman, along with Clayton Fountain, basically inspired the Supermax prison, in particular ADX over in Florence, Colorado, where the big dogs of the big dogs go. Like I talked about in the Barry Mills video, if you're a terrorist, if you are the top of the top of your gang leaders, Aryan Brotherhood, Bloods, Crips, Mexican Mafia, Nuestra Familia, this is where you go. If you're the Unabomber, this is where you go. Thomas Silverstein inspired this, which is just absolutely mind-blowing reading through his story. And not going to lie, uh, he's a guy that's been covered, um, but I don't care. I wanted to cover him today. I've read a lot about him, watched a lot of videos on him, and uh, I think I got some really good information on him. So, uh, basically, Tom was, you know, a life of crime. You know, he, it was childhood, didn't seem like the easiest. Mom, you know, kind of, you know, you don't want to, like, point to one thing, but one thing I do notice with a lot of these people I cover is, is issues with their mom, issues with parents in general, um, you know. Just kind of a rougher upbringing. In this particular case, mom, his mom had divorced and remarried a couple times during Silverstein's childhood. Um, Tom was described as shy, timid, almost awkward at times growing up. This is really important, and this is where I believe you know some of the first seeds were planted about violence and his understanding about violence. Um, he was picked on because the kids thought he was Jewish. All right, bullied beat up, when he would run home, crying to his mom, wanting his mom to do something about it, his mom demanded that he fight back, saying that if he didn't fight back, he would get a beating far worse from her when he got home. Then he went out and handled his business, went into the California Youth Authority, CYA, at the age of 14, where again, his beliefs in violence were reinforced. He was quoted as saying, anyone not willing to fight was abused. And if you know anything about the CY at California Youth Authority, I have watched interviews and read articles where people said adult prison was 10 times easier than the California Youth Authority and the things that went on inside of those, those places. So again, from a young age, breeding this thought and basically acceptance that violence will get you through anything and violence will get you what you want in the end. Um, so was going through the CYA. In 1971, at the age of 19, he was sentenced to San Quentin for armed robbery. Four years later, he was paroled, but was arrested again, and this kind of goes back to the family, with his dad and his brother. Between the three of them, they basically got what equated to, in today's money, less than like $11,000. But for his crimes, he was sentenced to 15 years at USP Leavenworth. Right in Kansas. This is kind of when the story picks up. This is kind of when it becomes known as Terrible Tom. Got in with the Aryan Brotherhood because you you got to remember, like we've talked about in the 70s and 80s, racial boundaries are really being formed. 
And if you are not aligned with the right people, you are a sheep and you are being hunted by wolves and you will go down. Made a name for himself. Was willing to commit acts of violence for the gang for himself. And that spilled out into the 1980 murder of Danny Atwell. Actually was a, a white gentleman who basically they wanted him to be a drug mule. Traffic heroin for the Aryan Brotherhood. Atwell refused. Tom killed him. For that murder, Tom was convicted and he was sent to, at the time, a max security prison, USP Marion in Illinois. Now, what's crazy, all right, was while he's in there, that conviction ends up being overturned, yada, yada, uh, basically because witnesses had perjured themselves, okay? But he's still in Marion and he's in a high security, it's called a control unit. And basically, it's a solitary confinement, living quarters. Lights on 24-7, meals through a slot, only allowed two phone calls a month. While he's at Marion in 1981, he's accused of killing a D.C. black gang member, Robert Chappelle. Along with, now remember this name, a gentleman, Clayton Fountain. All right? Once again, Tom saying, hey... I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Maintained his innocence the entire time. Didn't matter. While he ends up going to trial for this. While he's on trial for Chappelle's murder, the BOP, and remember, that's another thing I want to remember, the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, they transfer the D.C. Black's national leader, a gentleman by the name of Raymond Cadillac Smith. I just got to say that's a pretty cool nickname. I'm not going to lie. I really do like that nickname. Raymond Cadillac Smith shows up, the national leader of the D.C. Blacks. For all he knows, now he's looking at the guy that killed one of his members. And from the jump, Cadillac Smith wanted to and made it known that he wanted to and was going to kill Thomas Silverstein. He made it very clear. Thomas Silverstein is said to have tried to tell Cadillac Smith he didn't kill Chappelle. But it didn't matter. Cadillac Smith didn't believe him and told Tom to his face, I'm going to kill you. Now, remember how we talked about the BOP just a second ago. The entire time this is going on, you would think the BOP would keep these guys separate. Here you go, Thomas Silverstein. He supposedly killed a member of the D.C. Blacks. Now the national leader of the D.C. Blacks is in prison with him. They put him in the same unit together. And now that national leader... Cadillac Smith is telling everybody who will listen to him, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill Thomas Silverstein because of what I think he did. I'm going to kill him. Hey, everybody listen. I'm going to kill him. You would think they would separate him. They never did. Like Thomas Silverstein said, he said the guards wanted us to kill each other. They wanted to see the gladiator. They wanted to see the bloodbath. They wanted to see who would get to who first is basically what it came down to. And uh, unfortunately for Raymond Cadillac Smith, Thomas Silverstein and Clayton Fountain got to him first. With homemade weapons that they'd made and worked on for over a period of time, they ended up stabbing him 67 times. Now, it's not where it ended. Not only did they kill him by stabbing him 67 times, they then proceeded to drag his dead corpse up and down the catwalk in front of all the cells, to show off to the other prisoners. To let anybody know, you challenge me, you challenge the Aryan Brotherhood, this is what's going to happen. If we can get to the national leader of the D.C. Blacks, we can get to you. For this murder, which obviously Tom did not proclaim his innocence, he was given another life sentence. Now remember, by this time he's been in solitary confinement for a long time, or in this high controlled unit, and it's been proven long time in isolation. We are humans. We are not designed to be in isolation for extended periods of time. For Thomas Silverstein, the most isolated prisoner in U.S. history, this is to the extreme. Anger, mental health deteriorating. Um, A lot of things go into this. That brings us to the infamous murder of Officer Merle Klutz. 
Supposedly, CEO Merle Klutz was watching over Thomas Silverstein, had been harassing him, saying things here and there, culminated in him destroying paint, paintings uh, that Thomas Silverstein had done. You guys can see I put up some artwork that he's done where he was able to draw a cell, self-portraits of himself, other things. Um, the Bureau of Prisons actually responded to this saying that any drawings or paintings that uh, basically showed murders that they were instructed to throw them away. Hard to tell. Hard to tell. Silverstein said he was getting harassed all the whole time. The BOP says no. Other inmates, though, at spoke out and said, yes, Klutz was harassing him. I, I don't know. Um, what ends up happening? Silverstein plans um, with a guy by the name of Randy Gometz, if I'm saying that right, to get to Klutz. Klutz takes Thomas Silverstein out of the shower one day, uh, out to take a shower one day. Silverstein kind of has a does a little ruse where he's able to get Klutz to walk ahead of him, and he gets over to Randy Gometz's cell where Randy Gometz gets him a homemade knife. He's able to break free, gets out of his cuffs, gets the knife. He attacks Klutz, stabbing him multiple times and ultimately killing him. Now. On that same day, this is what's crazy. On the same day, Clayton Fountain, Thomas Silverstein, it's almost like he can't get one without the other. He attacks and kills Officer Robert Hoffman. Now, this is a little bit different. With Thomas Silverstein's account is that he was harassed by Merle Klutz, couldn't put up with it, pushed him to his breaking point. I will say this. Officer Hoffman was not that for Clayton Fountain. Clayton Fountain was fighting with two other CEOs. Officer Hoffman is considered a hero because he tried to help these two other officers. Fountain had a knife he'd gotten from another inmate. You know, this stuff was planned. He'd gotten, Fountain had also gotten a knife from an inmate. Hoffman runs over to help the two other officers. I think eventually four other ones were wounded, but unfortunately Hoffman was actually stabbed to death and, and did not recover from his wounds and died. I did read about this and... Um, you know, this one was very unfortunate. Not that, that, that any of the killings are unfortunate. Not just the guards' killings. Not just Cadillac Smith killings. All of them. I don't care what race you are. It's all very sad and unfortunate. Um, one is not more important than the other. Um, it, it is all just horrible. And this is what you get, though, in these extreme, high, violent environments. It's stress. It's anger, depression. People are scared. It's like you're a cornered animal and you need to kill or be killed almost. Um, and that goes for the guards too, as you can see. So on the same day, both are killed. What happens after this? And I'm sure a lot of you heard about this. USP Marion goes on an indefinite lockdown for 23 years. Tom is then transferred to USP Atlanta. Now, this is where the isolation really kicks in. He's basically placed on a no human contact list. All right. This is where the super max stuff really comes into play. This is why the ADX was designed because of Thomas Silverstein and Clayton Fountain. So, while he's in Atlanta, the cell was basically the size of a king size mattress. His only reading material was a Bible. And there was a, a buzzing, you know, like you can hear a light buzzing 24 hours a day over his head. And this is something that was interesting. I'd, not, I'd never actually heard about this, that while in Atlanta, he was only allowed to wear his underwear, no clothes, not allowed a single phone call, no social contact at all. Eventually, he was sent back to USP Marion. So it was a little bit bigger. It says, though, the BOP had two cameras on him at, at all times, 24-7. He was granted 300 minutes a month of phone time, better reading material, some art supply stuff, all that. Said he'd actually picked up practicing yoga. Now, around this time, he files, all right, he files a, a, uh, like a, like a lawsuit, basically, saying that, this is wrong. You can't do this no matter what I did, right? Um, you can't keep me in isolation for this long. So 
you know, this, and this is where I read about all this information about the underwear and just the Bible and this and that. And, um, just, they called it the Silverstein suite, right? When he went back to Marion, the Silverstein suite, he spent 15 years in there. Um, eventually in 2011, uh, the judge actually ruled against Silverstein lawsuit in a 43 page ruling, uh, basically stating that his conditions were the same as other inmates at, at Supermaxes, uh, you know, same as the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, Terry Nichols, Oklahoma City bomber, planning Ramsey Youssef, who was connected to the 1993 World Trade Center attack. Basically saying, hey, man, you're not going through anything other than, than what some of these other inmates are going through. I did read something that was really interesting. One of his attorneys, who had corresponded with Silverstein, at one point, he received a communication with, from Silverstein who had written him at 2 a.m. saying he couldn't sleep because he had so much to do. And I thought that was fascinating. And that is just the power of the human mind. Um, you know, basically, there he is. And that's what the attorney says. There he is in, in a max security isolation saying he can't sleep. Basically, because, you know, what do you do when you think about when you have so much to do, you can't sleep? In a way, you're excited. You have so much to do, you can't sleep. So I just really want you guys to think about that. And the human mind can can maneuver itself and get itself to a point where, you know, he adjusted so well. I mean, I will give Thomas Silverstein that. He was able to adjust to these extreme harsh conditions so well that I feel like a lot of men, it would break a lot of people. Um, and it's And they basically came out and said, the BOP said it is designed – to break people. Um, and their reasoning behind this was so that a guard, if somebody was planning on killing a guard, they would very much reconsider because of what happened to Thomas Silverstein and maybe do a lesser degree, Clayton Fountain and some of these other guys, Randy Gametz, um, these other people that helped the attack. But Thomas Silverstein was the poster boy for this. He's the guy that the BOP hates the most. He's the most hated prisoner by guards in the Bureau of Prisons. And he's the most admired and beloved by other inmates in the Aryan Brotherhood. And, and uh, not even just white gang members, but other, you know, other people of different races. Because he never bent to the system. No matter what they did to him, he held strong. He held firm. He never ratted. He never told. He never did anything to lessen his punishment. And that is how you get to be the most admired inmate in the history of the United States penal system. Um, finally, he's uh, transferred to the ADX Colorado in a 9 by 10 cell, 15 minutes phone time a month. The entire time he's in solitary. Um, Thomas Silverstein died May 11th, 2019 in his uh, late 60s. Just a fascinating, fascinating life. He was 67 years old when he died. Um, three to four victims. Remember the one he got overturned, but by that time he'd already killed a few other people. Um, so still talked about, still heavily covered today. Um, I just wanted to do it. I will be bringing you guys another one here uh, in a few days, but um, just had to cover this guy because he is the reason for... You know, some of these other guys I did, Barry Mills, some of these other guys, you know, they were in ADX. And it's like, this guy, Thomas Silverstein, is the reason the ADX was made. So anyway, appreciate you guys checking this video out. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, please like and subscribe, guys. It means a lot. Uh, you know, seeing the views, seeing the subscriptions, seeing the comments. I don't even care if they're negative, man. I know not everybody's going to like my videos. Um, that's okay. You know, if you're checking it out. Um, and you're subscribing and you're leaving a comment, that means a lot to me. I put a lot of work into this. Um, I do have a full-time job, so trying to bounce between the two can be challenging. But anyway, enough about that. Just appreciate you guys checking this out. Hope you enjoy the content. Until next time, see you later.